Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm just testing if you can hear me. Hi, Astrid. Hello? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You can. Oh, thanks. I'm done. Sorry, I'm in a car. <laughs> there was a storm here in Ireland, and I've been driving around looking for internet. And I found it, so I'm going to stay here in the car. <laughs> I'm really sorry about the background and everything. Um, so I think I made it. Um, um, uh, I can turn off my camera there in a minute. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Christine. Hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Lana. Um, uh, so I, I think I'm just on time now. Um, um, I just want to check how many people we have before we start. Um, you would think Ireland was, um, you know, internet safe area, but it turns out it's not. There's still <clears throat> there was a lot of interest for this webinar, so there are a lot of people um, that signed up for it. So I think we'll wait a couple of more minutes um, just to allow them to arrive now in the morning. See, Anna and Katie, you're both here. Candice, are you here? Hi, yes, I am. And uh, I think I see him there. Hi, Danny yeah, or nice Daniel. Well. Danny is better. Okay. Okay. Astrid, are you laughing at my inability to deal with storms after no, I don't. moving from Norway? <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to You're this like, network. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so should I be. So should I be. Kristen, for those of us who joined a little bit late, the background yes. of, of what's happening, why, what, <laughs> why are you in a storm? Are you okay? Should we, should we be allowed? Um, yes, I'm okay. Um, no, it's okay. Um, uh, but there's, in the village I live in, in Ireland, there's no, um, uh, the electricity is down, so there's no internet or or anything. So I was driving around. Look, I came to uh, through a few different villages, and I found internet. So I've parked up now. <laughs> I was uh, able to text um, a few people saying, "If I can make it, will you facilitate for me?" Yeah, but now I'm here. So that's the background. I'm sorry. Okay, 
we're still um, there's still people um being added to the meeting um, um, but Anahi, can you just remind me how do I say your last name uh, the full name is Anai Ayala Yakuchi. <laughs> Everyone froze for me. Sorry, you froze just as, as you were about to say your last name. Uh, it's Ayala froze, Yakuchi. Yep, yeah, Anahi Ayala Yakuchi. Well done. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um. Right. Um, so, um, just to let you know, everyone, this um, webinar is being recorded. Um, so the recording is already on. Um, and I think that um, we can start. And I can just introduce the community engagement forum um, before handing over to uh, our contributors today. Um, and then I might turn off my camera um, after that, just uh, so I can uh, um, make sure to have internet here as well. Uh, so welcome to everyone today. Um, it's great to see um, uh, so much interest for this webinar. Um, the Community Engagement Forum, we're um, uh, an online interagency community of practice on community engagement in displacement. Um, so we're part of the CCCM cluster, um, um, but um, open to practitioners from any sectors and clusters. And um, one of the things that we do in our community practice is organizing events um, like this, where we invite uh, experts um, to contribute to discuss um, community engagement topics that have been requested by uh, the members of our community practice. So. Um, um, this has been a long awaited um, uh, topic now uh, on digital um, complaints and feedback mechanisms and accountability systems. So we spent some time preparing for it and getting really good at contributors. Um, and today we have um, um, uh, from IOM, we have um, Danny Coyle and uh, Candice Holt. Um, Danny is a uh, Zeit Manager Technical Consultant and uh, Candice is um, uh, also site manager, technical consultant from NORCAP to IOM. And then from UNHCR, we have Anahi Iyal. I already forgot how to say it, Anahi. Ayala Yakuchi. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, who is a consultant um, under Accountability to Affected People Division of international protection in UNHCR and we have uh, Katie Drew um, who's a senior protection officer um, in UNHCR under accountability to affected people and um, division of international protection as well. Um, so um, uh, today first um, um, our staff, uh, our colleagues from IOM will um, introduce the site manager um, and uh, I won't try and um, and introduce that. I will let them do that. Um, and then we'll have some time for um, Q&A immediately after that, before our colleagues from UNHCR present the systems that they um, work with. Um, and if you want to um, post any questions in the chat while they present, you can do that. And then um, um, and I can um, share them afterwards in the Q&A or you can just raise your hand afterwards and uh, when we have some time for Q&A uh, immediately after the um, presentation. Um, so there you go. Um, and I think I'll just hand over to IOM directly to Danny and Candice. Uh, if that's OK with you guys, Danny, Candice. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Let me just share my screen so I can put up the presentation. Let me know when you can see it. Let me just share this screen. Yep, yeah, we can see it. You see a chat, a, a chat now. Your desktop. Um. Okay. What about now? Australia. Now. Yeah. Now's VC site manager. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so thank you for having us here today. As Kristen said, my name is Candice and I'm here with uh, Danny to talk about Site Manager and more broadly talk about IOM, CCCM's approach to CFMs. Um, if I may request, please keep your questions uh, until the end of the presentation. Um, if you think of something while we're presenting, feel free to put it in the chat so you don't forget, and then we will get to it in the end. Uh, I do think we have a lot of time for questions today, so please don't be concerned, um, and please uh, do write down if you do have some. So what we're going to go through today, of course, we're going to talk about Zite Manager, the application, where we're using it, what it is exactly, but we are going to focus a little bit more on CCCM and CFM. Common challenges we've faced, how does our approach work, how is it being used, and looking at what does this mean for accountability, um, and also obviously if you want more information, that's what we'll be covering there. I'm going to hand over to Danny to introduce a little bit more about Zite and answer the first few questions you can see there on the slide. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, OK, so the the first place we always start is is kind of this general question of what is Zite Manager? What do we mean by that? Um, because this is something that has changed over time and we'll talk a little bit about the history. But I think in, in succinct, uh, we have noticed that uh, a lot of times people want to focus either on you know, programmatic elements of a CFM. So maybe let's say whether we're collecting feedback through a hotline or a help desk. And then there's another realm of, of kind of technology, which is uh, what technology we use to collect that. And really what we think about when we talk uh, about our own program is really the combination of both. Um, we don't think either one of these realms of work uh, has the complete picture, the complete solution. And actually what our work has been doing is changing both of these circles progressively over time so that they kind of have more and more overlap. And we're kind of more and more using technology to fulfill best practice. But but, you know, best practice is the target, right? Like what we want to achieve as programmers and what we think as a programming staff are kind of our objectives and what is most important to us. So it's just to be aware that when we talk about Zite Manager, we're not really, it's an application, uh, unfortunately, like the name's confusing. So it is an application, but it is also referring to progressively what we've come to think of is, is an approach um, to how we manage data, how we collect information, things like this. Um, OK, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the application because I think uh, you know this uh, specific form is a little bit focused on technology and we didn't want to leave you uh, hungry. Uh, what Zite Manager is, is basically, I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see so many people on the call. Uh, we'll go into the history, but when you start working with CFMs uh, or feedback, feedback represents uh, a different type of data than I would say that we're, we're good at handling as humanitarians. So most data that we collect that constitutes feedback needs something to happen, right? Like it asks for us to do something as, as an, uh, an audience, right? So that means that we need to maybe refer it, we need to update it, right? We need to make sure this person who missed a distribution gets included in the next distribution, something like this. And we didn't really find many tools out there. So what we started doing was we, we didn't really wanna reinvent the wheel. Um, we looked at private sector solutions Private sector solutions uh, we were really wary of because of the cost implicit in those solutions. Um, and we really had seen a problem of feedback at scale. So any sort of solution that gets more expensive as the volume of feedback increases is really bad for humanitarians because often our budgets don't increase over time, they decrease, right? So we're really looking for something that returns kind of uh, efficiency at scale. And what we what we have right now is a very generic platform. So nothing about Zite Manager as a data platform is specific to CFM. That said, we have built a data platform uh, with the idea of building in functionality, features, things that are useful, important, uh, helpful in managing feedback. Uh, so, so basically, at the end of the day, Zite Manager is not just a CFM system. It's actually just a data management platform. Uh, it's based on Koba ODK. So what that means is when we collect feedback, we're actually using an ODK form, and that gets submitted into our platform, and we work with it there. 
Um, however, you know, we originally started with ODK, which is, is the reason we were really attracted to a solution that allowed us to continue with it. But ODK has a lot of problems. I think I've seen a lot of systems that are ODK based used for CFM and they they struggle, right? Because it's very one way, right? You submit something into the ODK server and yeah, uh, that's kind of it. Like you have to download it and then you work with it in a different system. So ours is more of a system that, that allows you to kind of continuously interact with those forms. Um, yeah, so basically I think the third point is just what I said. Um, off of that, once data comes into a platform, we realize that we, you know, there's a lot of work we were doing manually. So like, for example, we know we're not going to refer this issue because this issue is not something that we can refer, you know, we're recording it as an FYI. So all of those, you know, we want the system to automatically close that issue or do something with it. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we built in all these ways in which we can determine automatically what happens as information comes into our system. And we really wanted to to kind of de-emphasize the role of the IM. And by that, I don't mean to say IMs are not important because I think they are very much like uh, important for us, but we didn't want IM, like what I see around the world are IMs copying and pasting information and sending it to people. And I think that in this day and age is really silly. I think that's a really bad use of people's time. So we really wanted a system where people automatically had access over the data they needed to have access to. They could edit it, they can download it, they can interact with it without needing to pick up the phone and call the IM or send them an email. Um, so that was, again, like that's really big emphasis for us is giving people access to the data they need to. So not more data, but the appropriate level of data. Um, yeah. So how does this work at the end of the day? There's there's kind of different uh, pieces to our, our platform. We have um, like a web app application, which means that you can go to the website, log in. You can interact and do everything on a website. Uh, you also have a mobile phone application that works on Android phones, and you can work offline online in the mobile phone, which is really important for us. Um, yeah, but but basically they're they're kind of the same. They allow you to do different the same thing. Um, you can do less in the mobile application than you can do in the web, but uh, I think that makes sense. So yeah, that's a little bit about the application. We could talk for hours about it. <laughs> um, there's documentation online. If if you're really curious, you can set up a, a call with us after maybe. Uh, okay, so history. Uh, I uh, was hired in Bangladesh as the CWC coordinator for IOM site management, uh, and I was tasked with, let's say, fixing or m making the CFM work. Uh, we had a very large CFM that was set up during the emergency phase. We were receiving around 8,000 pieces of feedback uh, a month. Today, we receive around 15,000 pieces of feedback a month. Uh, it deals, you know, with any sort of issue within the response, any sort of sector, uh, all the different agencies working in Cox Bazaar. So as a result of this problem, you know, you can see maybe why we took this very automated, organized approach to how we manage and process feedback, because we just, if we looked at how many people we would need to do things inefficiently, it, I mean, it's huge. And already the team in Cox Bazaar is very large. So as a result of that, we kind of, you know, Bangladesh was where we initially refined a process. And then with some support from GFFO, we were able to scale that solution uh, to different contexts around the world. And we've started doing different things because we, we find a similar set of problems related to any sort of data or any sort of uh, process that that doesn't just you know end with one one step right that has a multiple step process so any sort of process management is really what we have started looking at or any sort of uh, data that is live that needs to be updated on a very regular basis this is really where i think we found a, a niche and found that that we've we have a, a workable solution um, yeah, I mean, I think the rest is just numbers and, and information that you guys can look at uh, whenever you want. That's all. Is this me as well, Candice? Yes, please continue. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, why why is CCCM really interesting with respect to CFM? Um, so for me, I think CCCM is, is a really important actor in where it sits because we often have a huge uh, range of community engagement programming, as people know, um, and we also play this coordination role at a local level. And really what we see is our CFM, at least you know when I was thinking about the initial parameters and having these discussions at Cox Bazaar, you know, we, we don't really have the luxury of saying to someone, 
hey, sorry, we're not going to take this feedback because it's not about us. Go go speak to that other agency. Um, that doesn't really work when you're doing community engagement. Um, especially when people think of you as site management, they think you are site management, you are in charge of this coordination, you are talking to all the other agencies, you have a management role in this uh, area. So, you know, please help me. Uh, and for that reason, we kind of realized that this normal process of just referring feedback and stopping doesn't really work for us. Um, and actually, we we also understand our role a bit differently is, yeah, we, we should step in. This person has come to us they're they're asking for us to help them. We should do more than just refer their issue and say, sorry, it's not in our hands anymore. So we really wanted to kind of think of our role in a more robust process that actually means that if we collect feedback, we are kind of taking responsibility for closing the feedback loop. Uh, and in this is, I would say, a really big change to other models of feedback collection uh, where kind of the responsibility ends at referral. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe that because we are coordinators as much as we are kind of community engagement uh, practitioners, we have a larger obligation not just to collect the feedback, but track the feedback over its lifespan. Um, and so this is a really big design difference, I would say. it's It doesn't mean we're better. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that we have maybe a different mandate than than other CEA actors. And as a result of that difference in mandate, we have developed a little bit of a different system that is uh, emphasizing tracking, that is emphasizing, you know, really uh, trying to find out what happened to any given piece of feedback at the end of the day and really making sure the person has been provided a response. Uh, yeah, so in this, we are floating this idea, uh, which is this is like a, let's say a workshop term that we've been uh, discussing. We think there's this idea missing in accountability uh, it's not to replace existing ideas or existing commitments, but we are really thinking about CCCM as an actor that you know has all the the kind of accountability mandates other actors have. But we think we have an additional mandate to really consider, promote, and uh, monitor what we consider what is like operational accountability. So to us, that means, how much are the responders in a location responding like you know responding to listening uh, considering uh, what the population is telling us through feedback mechanisms through community engagement programming uh, and obviously cfm is just one way in which we do that it's not the only way but we're really thinking of our role as trying to foster a wider sense of accountability with our work and with our presence through the coordination apparatus. So, right, if we know that there is a huge uh, demand for improved wash services, for example, how are we using and leveraging our role as coordinators to action that with uh, our partners in the wash cluster? Uh, just to give you an example. So this is a this is a new idea, um, but it, it is very much something we're trying to consider and build through this approach of CFM. We're trying to action this through new indicators, better indicators about whether or not we're receiving responses, whether or not other clusters are responding to the feedback that we have documented. OK, thanks, Danny. So instead of now just going and talking about some of the challenges that I'm sure come to mind when we talk about CFM challenges or why, or if we talk about why operational accountability would be important. I would like us to do a tiny exercise together. In Instead of talking about it, I want us to picture ourselves as Rosa. So everyone is in the right frame of mind when we talk about challenges to the CFM, but also looking further into operational accountability and CFMs. So Rosa is a 55-year-old widow. She lives in a very large IGP cam, and she was away with a neighbour, and she missed her hygiene kit distribution. So she was visiting a neighbour, and she missed her distribution. Now what she needs to do is try and fix that problem. However, she doesn't know where or who, where to find the help or who to talk to or who the WASH organization is. So let's go on a journey with her. And what we've done is use common 
examples or common issues that have been reported by people that have tried to seek help or provide feedback. And we're going to use that example. This is not to single out particular types of feedback channels or that there is a right way or a wrong way to collect feedback. This is just to show you what we see as a common problem for those that are trying to report feedback. So let's say Rosa goes first to the shelter help desk during a shelter distribution. Now I know what you're all thinking. That means they probably can't help her with her issue with hygiene kits. So she's told maybe go visit the WASH organization offices if she can find them over the other side of the site. Because as we know, help desks for shelter, if they're during a shelter distribution, can be quite helpful for that particular purpose, but they're not necessarily designed to collect feedback for other types of services. So she goes to community consultation. There's a community consultation happening in her area. They're discussing problems that are happening in the community. They're also discussing people's experiences. So, Ro so Rosa raises her issue with the facilitators and they record it. But the facilitators aren't aware of what type of information to collect and they don't necessarily collect any contact information about Rosa. There's no instruction on where to go to get your hygiene kit, how the WASH organization is going to contact her and the consultation team, which happens a lot. Um, her report just gets lost in all the data that they collected because that wasn't really the purpose of the consultation. So Rosa doesn't hear back. She waits a week or two. She then asks a neighbor and calls the hotline. There's a hotline they've heard about that is designed to receive feedback for an organization and their programs. When Rosa calls, they say, well, that's not our program. However, we can do an external referral for you. We'll try and send your feedback to the WASH organization. However, when they do send her feedback to the WASH organization, it's missing important information required to process it. And the WASH organization is not sure what to do with this feedback. It's now unclear who does the follow up. Do, does the hotline contact Rosa again to get more information or does the WASH organization do it and her complaint or her feedback is just stuck in a bit of a loop? She finally finds site management office across way across the other side of the site. Um, they do know where to refer it. They already organized with the WASH organization what information they need to do the referral. However, the WASH organization is now struggling with all the feedback they're receiving from different CFMs. The case will take time to process. So what are the main challenges that have happened when Rosa has tried to seek support for a missed hygiene distribution? There are, I mean, and the obvious ones is there needs to be more community knowledge about CFMs. And how do we make CFMs more accessible to someone like Rosa trying to report her feedback? However, let's look a little bit more closely at a collective humanitarian response. What are our challenges actually actioning Rosa's feedback? This is not, necessar not necessarily, it's helpful if Rosa knows where to go, but it's not necessarily Rosa's role to find the right person or the right feedback. If we're looking at operational accountability, we are trying to create a space where we can refer within each other and organize and process that for her. You can see some of the challenges that are starting to appear is that there's many different avenues and there's and there seems to be a lot of focus, what we've seen in most places, in collecting feedback and referring it, but not necessarily in the follow up and the response. We don't know what happened to Rose's feedback. Did the WASH organization get to Rose's feedback? Did they 
receive that or not. As a response, we can't see. We can see that through different systems, there might have been some reports of a complaint, but not necessarily that something had happened to that. So let's look at, after this, we're going to look at our approach to try and resolve some of this, because we can see it is a coordination challenge, but also that we have a processing challenge, because the service providers are also struggling with the amount of feedback they're receiving, and it makes it very inefficient, and it's also very difficult to then create and establish standards for accountability if we can't actually see because everyone's using different terms and collecting feedback in different ways. Danny, can you explain what's happening and what we have tried to do, not saying we resolved everything, but what we have tried to do to resolve some of these challenges? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so this is where we've um, kind of want to emphasize that this is not just a technical like technical problem, right? Candace has been telling you a story that is largely, you know, a programmatic story. I think a very real one. Um, this is where we see kind of various adjustments that need to be made. I mean, one of them is really saying, OK, you know, uh, Rose's problem is not a secret, right? She's going around like desk to desk to desk to try and get someone to help her with this issue, right? One of the main problems technically behind that is that the systems that different agencies are using or even within the same, let's say, camp or area that she is, they don't really speak to each other. They're not really recording her issue in the standardized way, you know, so, so someone's maybe recording it as misdistribution or maybe she someone else is saying she's upset with the distribution, right? Like what her problem is might be recorded differently in different areas. And then people are kind of uh, stopping the process as soon as the issue is or is not referred. Maybe, right, she's getting different answers, different places. So we really want to kind of centralize this information in one system. So regardless of whether, you know, where it's being collected, we're really recording it the same way, and then we're going to manage it the same way, right, D depending on what the issue is. And then we also really want to be transparent with this process. Like, as, as I said, Rosa is coming to us. She's not saying, please keep my issue secret. This is sensitive. She's saying, please help me get a solution from the concerned party. Um, and as a result, I think we can manage this process a bit different. Um, so, yeah, this is a little bit, you know, in a nutshell, we can break down our approach and values in different ways, focusing on uh, transparency, focusing on efficiency, um, focusing on collaboration, right? Like, I, I don't think Rose's issue needs to be kept secret. I think I think she's asking us to work together, right? She's asking us as site management to help produce an answer from WASH. Uh, Again, in terms of like closing the feedback loop, Rosa wants an answer, right? Now that answer could be positive, it could be negative, but I think she is entitled to, you know, at, at minimum an answer uh, from the people that she has gone to. Uh, and, and again, this is really big for us in terms of, you know, not passing the buck in terms of our responsibility for engaging in Rosa. Um, finally, like in terms of this idea around data minimalization, this is, a little bit connected to how we categorize and think about the the ordering of feedback, but oftentimes we see people collecting a ton of information from Rosa. When was the date of the distribution? What did you receive? Have you received things in the past? What is your ID number? Without really understanding what is actually necessary to refer this issue. Like, have we sat down and said, when someone misses a distribution, what information do we need to collect from them in order to make a referral effectively, right? And then having a system that helps you on like know that like I you shouldn't have to remember that as a field staff like what pieces of information are required for each and every referral you make because I will tell you there are our field staff are very busy they're very hardworking. I cannot remember all of these things off the top of my head how could they so what we've done is we've we've you know tabularize that we've turned that into an automated process so that as you understand what Rose's issue is and as you categorize it correctly, the kind of prompts for what information you needed are automated and based on agreements with those clusters that, that we've done in advance. Um, 
again, so where is this leading us? These kind of detailed uh, approaches and values are kind of leading us to a larger standard and a kind of uniform system. So we, we can disagree in different contexts with how individual referrals or, or pieces of feedback are managed. We can identify bottlenecks, we can identify problems, but the, I, th I think the thing I'm most uh, proud of uh, with respect to my work is not a perfect system, but a system that shows you where it is imperfect. And it is often imperfect. It is often very flawed uh, how referrals happen and how referrals are actually processed, being processed, not processed within a response. And I, I think that's really the key of what we're going for is because I, I, I don't think taking the approach that any one system is going to work and that all the issues are going to be resolved is really effective. We are really going for a system where we are dealing with things the same way, but we can change over time uh, when we need. Uh, and we also have an understanding of what is and isn't being done and what has and has not been done. Next slide. OK, um, I also want to talk Danny? a little bit about. Yeah. Hi, Hi this is Christian. Um, uh, Thanks very much. Um, um, I just want to ask you to maybe can you round up um, um, the presentation a little bit to make sure we have ample time for Q&A um, and for you and Nazir's presentation as well. Yeah, sure. So okay. maybe let's skip this Thank slide. Uh, Candice, and the next slide. Mm. Um, this yeah, one, probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, in short, we we make standards for a lot of things. I mean, we have models for how feedback is collected. We have feedback like standards for how things are referred. I think the information is on the slide that you guys can go in after. You can always catch us later. Uh, yeah, in the interest of time, we'll speed up through this. Um, yeah, and this is all examples of what we're saying. Uh, yeah, um, and we'll skip this one as well. <laughs> uh, okay. In terms of challenges, I do want to mention uh, challenges, and I think it actually segues to my last point, is I think what we have achieved is a picture of accountability that is not a pretty picture, uh, quite honestly. I think the reality is our main challenges are no longer with recording feedback or managing feedback or referring feedback or even going back to the person and letting them know what response we've seen. The major challenges we have is people who receive referrals are often not giving us responses. They're often not taking feedback seriously. They're often favoring their own internal assessments and targeting exercises over what we have told them we are receiving through our various channels. Uh, and there is very little pressure on individual agencies uh, to engage in our or other other feedback systems. And I think that's actually at the core of the issue is if we want to see better collective accountability and better accountability just in general, we need to work together and we need to pressure agencies and have it as an expectation that they respond to referrals. Um, understandably, some many of the times when people respond, they say, we cannot do this. We do not have money to provide this level of additional assistance or to build more latrines or whatever it is. Uh, I think that's also something donors and the wider community need to hear. That is, if you cut funding and you demand, you know, a 100 percent resolution to uh, like feedback, this is not realistic. Uh, you can't cut funding and expect more and, and expect everyone's desires to be fulfilled. Um, I would say as as bleak of a picture I've just painted, I want to say there there are good examples that do exist out there. We we have seen them and we can point to them. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, they're they're fewer and far between. On the next slide, I just want to say uh we're in process of developing a lot of detailed guidance. Uh we found a lot of really great high level examples and, and documents that help you think about principles and objectives, but very little in terms of like how do I turn Kobo into an FAQ tool or how do we minimize data collection during feedback? So we're trying to pull this all together and launch a little bit of a resource hub at Q1. If you're interested in staying in touch with us, you can sign up to our mailing list. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is everything. And these are our contact information and you can find more on our website. I think that's all from us. Thanks Sorry for very much, Danny and Candice. Uh, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, extremely impressive, I think, as a system. And uh, um, I also really appreciate that you mentioned that um, uh, that is not perfect and that you're actively looking for the imperfections uh, in the system to improve it. Um, um, and uh, uh, maybe a webinar. If you could post, you know, the uh, this information that you had.
in the end there with your contact information and the website for the site manager um, and the um, presentation as well with the slides on the CE forum. That would be great. Um, uh, there were some requests there for the slides. Um, Donald, uh, sorry, I can't see your last name. Donald has a question. You're raising your hand. All right. Um, uh, thank you, Christian. Not really a question. My name is uh, Donald Baturi uh, from NIC Nigeria, a CFM focal person for the country office. So uh, I just wanted to hit on uh, two points that uh, uh, Francesco mentioned. Uh, the referrals and then uh, how we uh, uh, go about managing the referrals. I also noticed that uh, when the referrals are shared, uh, the persons, the appropriate persons who share these referrals will take a long time to uh, get back to us with a response. But uh, what I think we need to do about this is when we have a standardized referral system, the the uh, choose the flow chart and how the referrals are done and then in terms of uh sharing the referrals with donors if we can have a standardized database that shows uh where we document referrals and then other things it will be good that's just my point for this thank you thank you donald um do you want to, um, uh, uh, Danny or Candice, do you want to, um, to share any response to Donald? Uh, not anything more than, yeah, we agree that there needs to be um, more attention on referrals and working harder to make sure there is more accountability on um, what service providers are doing and whether we can do replies. I'm not sure. I mean, in terms of central database for the donors, uh, obviously it would depend on what information. So we do have live operational dashboards that are available on our website to see exactly what type of feedback is coming in, how fast they're being responded to, and what stages different processes are at. But in terms of sharing any information about the actual person that's given that feedback, that obviously is not something you would share outside of the provider that needs to respond to that. Thanks, All right, thank you, Christine. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the data protection and then confidentiality about sharing uh, those informations. So what I was uh, looking at is uh, in terms of uh, a more needed assistance, these referrals can be shared to see these are the status. It was shared with this uh, partners, but unfortunately they don't have the funds or resources to uh, uh, to support this. So maybe like you said, uh, just some uh, particular information about the referrals can be shared. Maybe it can give more, uh, it can give more room to funding and other things. Thank you and over. Thank you. Um, good points, Donald. Um, uh, uh, Nuruksi, um, your hand is up next. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, colleagues, for the great presentation. This is uh, Ruxandra from the Global CCCM Cluster. Um, to begin with, it's really wonderful to hear about the uh, different partners, CFMs, and uh, how they function and the challenges met. This is a very great way to share this kind of practices. Um, I just have a quick comment and a few questions uh, for colleagues. Um, firstly, I think we need to recognize that CFM is an integral part of CCCM programming and um, complaints and feedback is a component that needs to be implemented generally fully by uh, by those uh, with the site management responsibilities. So um, essentially when um, when a complaint is raised um, that should be intrinsically tracked and feedback should be provided by the camp management site management agency um, directly uh, as in I would just uh, just refer to the fact that there was a challenge referred to with regards to to feedback not being provided 
um, to those that raised it, but a referral pathway would have been the response. I have experience from several locations where CCCM was implemented um, and and the, my experience, at least if I can refer to previous previous work that I've done with DRC, for instance, um, in camps we had accountability officers which indeed indicated the referral pathway, but also were responsible to connect again with the person raising the referral and providing feedback uh, to the person of whether or not uh, our own camp management efforts of coordinating and supporting um, people's needs were resolved on our side or not. And then also understanding from the person what challenges they had faced in their own efforts to resolve their issue. So um, I think, yeah, it just emphasizes the role that CCCM needs to have with regards to communicating with communities um, overall. Um, I would have some questions as well with regards to the data collection aspect. Um, if colleagues could please just clarify, um, is this a systematic data collection exercise that's being rolled out, uh, you explained through Kobo, or is it that um, the complaints or feedback from the people is received spontaneously whenever those are raised? How exactly does that work? That would be very interesting to understand. Um, and just with regards to coordinating at site level, um, aspects which may not uh, necessarily have uh, have response from the agency responsible. Um, we've encountered that from a cluster coordination perspective with other similar CFM um, systems in several countries. Um, and I suppose the, the response to that or the very quick solution that comes to mind is just indicated to the cluster coordinators uh, be those subnational or national if the situation remains and then there's some coordination that takes place at that level and of course again from the coordination team there's also that connection to donors that can push for you know if you don't have a, a wash response or there's a, wa a wash response that's continuously inadequate in a site I guess an elevation mechanism uh, will have to fall into place. Um, similar systems have been also piloted in several countries with regards to that higher level uh, coordination and referral mechanisms. I'm referring here to a, a Yemen example um, that's available in the in the clusters case studies for more potential reference. Um, but yeah, I would be just generally interested to hear more about how that system how the site manager system works in that in that sense. Um, and then with regards to the indicators that are chosen or how exactly are the um, complaints tracked against, that would be something else that would be interesting to understand whether or not that's a coordination that takes place at site level with those providing services and those indicators are related to that, or is there need Again, I'm thinking from a cluster correlation perspective, um, is there need for those indicators to be more top level or how? what's the thinking at the moment on that? I would also agree with some of Francesco's uh, questions, but I'll, I'll let him also ask um, if he'd like. Thank you. Okay, can I field those questions? Sorry, Francesca, before you go, uh, just so I remember what they what they were. Thank you for those. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, your first question is about who does the collection? Is this something that is scheduled or is spontaneous? So for CCCM, they have, it, it depends on the program. So different CCCM missions, different responses. You can build a CFM program around Zite Manager. Maybe in, for example, in Ethiopia, they have uh, CCCM staff that visit the sites once or twice a week. And one of their roles is to collect uh, feedback or they can run community meetings. There's many different ways you can do this. Or for example, in Bangladesh, you have um, CCCM staff in the camps every day and there are dedicated CFM staff. There is absolutely different very, very different ways you can do this. And Zite Manager and the forms can be applied to any type of feedback collection. So you build 
your CFM program around the response that you're in? Um, I'm not completely clear on the second question, so I might jump to the third for the moment. So how are the indicators for collection uh, selected? So this is to do with the referral standards. So creating categories of feedback and what types of issues could possibly arise from those feedback is done for with CCCM with the different clusters and service providers. So for example, in let's say in Democratic Republic of Congo, we recently launched Zeit and we spoke to the different clusters, the providers, and asked what are the systems and the services you provide at the site level? What categories do you need to see for your referrals? And what could possibly go wrong with those? And that's how we build the form and the intake of how we're collecting that feedback. If you'd like to repeat question two for me, uh, that would be good or we can move on. I do also want to just mention, um, we did have a slide that we ran out of time to talk about, was about um, the CFM cycle and how we, as CCCM, as we take responsibility for collecting the feedback, we also take responsibility for applying. So even if that feedback isn't resolved or isn't responded to, CCCM should still be giving the reply and communicating to the person what happened to their feedback. So that's something that is built into the program and is very important that we are able to track that we have closed the feedback. I will stop there. Um, and I'm handing over to another person to ask a question. Is that correct? Or, or yeah, maybe I'll uh, address uh, Francesco's uh, comment real quickly. I mean, there, there's a lot of ways uh, it would it would be exhaustive to say them all. I mean, I'll give you some, which is that, right, like everything is automatically assigned a tracking number. Everything is automatically assigned a status. Things are organized by cluster and sector. We use APIs to generate daily referral sheets so that when you open an Excel file, you automatically see all of the open feedback related to a given sector or camp or you know however you need your data organized without requiring you know an email from an IM Really, like we don't email data anymore. We give you a file, we give you a system, and you can interact with that data. You can refer that data. You can bring that data to a coordination meeting as you need to in the execution of your work as a camp manager. So, I mean, these are some of the ways we also do a lot of like streamlining on making sure when I'm entering the feedback, I'm getting prompted by the form to tell you like what information is required. So like it doesn't ask you for a name if we're not going to be making a referral. Uh, if, if the person is asking a common question, you see the, the FAQ answer that is in our system and we can update this as often as we need. So like on this, it's a great question, but on this front, we find that there's very little advice actually out there and the ways in which we can improve someone's life as a, as a field staff. There are like hundreds of different ways and we've tried to do as many as we can and we're still discovering some, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is why we want to kind of start a resource hub to kind of chronicle the various challenges that field officers have and how we can help because uh, there's no one like specific solution to that question. Thank you. Um, sorry, if I can jump in here. Um, uh, so we are, uh, I mean, I have also um, loads of questions and I'm sure many people do as uh, so we could go on and on talking about the site manager. Um, but we also, I really want to hear from uh, Unit CR. Um, um, so if I can ask Pedro and Donald and uh, Deng also had a question, I think, um, or if there's any unanswered questions um, uh, from you, Francesco, that um, uh, wasn't clarified. If you can either put them in the chat to Danny and Candice now or wait until after uh, UNITCR has presented um, their system and we can have uh, we'll have more time for uh, Q&A then. Is that OK? Um, so I'm not forgetting to uh, or save your questions. Um, and then I can uh, hand over to Anahi, I think it is. Or is it uh, Katie? Uh, no, it's going to be me. Yeah, it's very definitely Anahi. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, can you all see my screen and the presentation? Yes. yes. Fantastic. We can, yes, but you might want to go to presenters view or whatever it's called. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay. good? Perfect. Perfect. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for the IUM colleagues. It was uh, it was absolutely amazing, uh, and I do have a lot of questions that I'm going to keep for the end. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, basically UNHCR efforts into trying to. Um, in a way, do the same thing that IOM was just talking about, actually, uh, in terms of trying to really streamline the way in which we process and we understand feedback that we um, we get from the populations that we work with. So this started, this is kind of like a bit of a journey for, um, for UNHCR because uh, it started with the project that was done in between 2020 and 2022. And it was a project where we were specifically looking at how can we actually make sure that everything that we collect from the affected population that we work with actually ends up being used for us to get better programming and better operations uh, on the ground. And the reason why that project started was that in both in 2020 and in 2018, um, UNHCR had a couple of research and evaluation uh, reports that basically highlighted the fact that while uh, the organization was able to collect a lot of feedback or using multiple channels, uh, different sectors were involved into doing that, there was a challenge with the way in which that data was then put together and used as a way to inform programming in the long term. And the other thing that was coming up from it was that uh, a lot of the data that was collected from communities using different CFMs was actually staying within the sector or within uh, the specific project that that data was collecting into. And that made it very difficult for the organization to actually being able to look at you know, what are we actually doing overall as an organization, not just the protection uh, cluster or the wash cluster or the shelter cluster. So the UNHCR internal project was divided into different phases, but what we started to do was basically doing a very boring, if you want, uh, mapping where we really started looking at, okay, what is it? What are these complaint and feedback mechanisms that we have? Are they protection desks? Are they call centers? Are they, um, you know, uh, suggestion boxes? And we mapped out the different types of it. And we did, we mapped out how much of the channels were uh, digital or not digital, but also what kind of tools were we actually using to process the data in the back end? Were we doing it manually? Were we doing it uh, using um, Kobo or Excel spreadsheet and so on? So we wanted to figure out what the landscape was. And having done that, we also started to look at how was this information organized? If people were receiving um, a number of, of uh, feedback and complaints, how were they organizing that information in order then to be able to analyze it and then actually use it to inform uh, their operations. The second part of the project was taking everything that we've collected and actually trying to come up with something that could help streamline this process. And what we came up with was that if we could guarantee at the minimum that every single CFM used on the ground internally by UNHCR, but also by uh, UNHCR partners use the same data structure. We didn't really care about the tool that they were using, being it digital, being it paper based. We could actually at the end call, put all of the data together and analyze it together. So we basically looked at what is the intake form? What is the data structure that is being used to collect feedback that also speaks to what information do you actually need at the minimum to be able to respond and do something? And then we looked at once we have collected that data, what do we need to extract? And now it needs to be presented for the different actors within the organization to be able to use it, because not everybody needs the same information, not everybody needs the same type of analysis. Now, this project um, ended in December 2022. Uh, it, it involved around 12 different countries within the organization, and three of them actually piloted 
um, the different final products that we created with this project. One was this feedback form or logbook, uh, which is very simply a form um, in uh, different situations. One of the things that for us was um, also interesting about this is that the feedback form can be deployed regardless of the tool that you used. It can be deployed as an online form, as a COBOL form, as an Excel spreadsheet, as a printed out paper form, as a prompt form for suggestion boxes. So the idea is that it could be used in whatever channel you are, um, you've decided to use or deploy in that situation. And then we have uh, connected to it a Power BI uh, analytical dashboard that basically is specifically tailored to the different sectors. What information do they need to see and how do they need to drill down to that information? And then attached to that, we developed uh, a taxonomy, which is basically just a way to categorize the information so that if a suggestion box is, is collecting um, complaint and feedback and uh, an information desk is doing that, they are categorizing that data in the same way so that someone at the central office can actually merge that information together and analyze it. So from this project, we learned a couple of things. And um, the first one was that the success of a specific CFM, at least internally for the organization, was not linked as much as to the technology that we were using, but it was very much used, uh, connected to the fact that the uh, organization was really able to deploy the right tool in the right context for the right group of people that we were uh, we wanted to interact with. So we um, started to invest a lot more into information needs assessment and trying to actually push for revamping the UNHCR information um, uh, needs assessment that has been created some years ago and really trying to push uh, the organization internally to make sure that those assessments become a standard procedure for the organization to be able to know exactly where are the people that we want to interact with and based on that we decide how we're going to build our CFMs. The second thing was that um, technology wise it was a lot easier to remain agnostic and to allow different operations to deploy uh, the technology that they felt was the best one in their context. Uh, context differ, you know, uh, enormously, at least for the type of work that UNHCR does. If you think about a place like South Sudan or a place like Ukraine, you have a very different kind of context when it comes also to technology availability. So the idea was we don't necessarily need to have a specific platform or to give or suggest a specific platform as long as that platform responds to the requirements that we have in terms of data privacy and and uh, data security, then we can allow or, uh, you know, the different offices to deploy what they think is better for them. The other thing that we learned from this project was that we if we are asking um, staff to use data, which is, you know, feedback and complaints are translated into data. If we're asking staff to use that information and that data, we need to help them knowing how to do that. And not everybody may be um, used to you to be data driven or to make decisions based on the data that they receive. So there's a lot more that needs to be done. If we say we are a data driven organization, then what does the staff need to know and to be able to do when they are given a piece of data? And then um, the last thing that we definitely learned was that every single operation finds their own ways to go around the different challenges that they may have. And those challenges overall may be very similar, but actually in every operation they differ considerably. And so the idea of creating something that then can be customized and can be adapted to the situations where people are was something that for us is kind of like a big push towards whatever system we're thinking about. It needs to be highly customizable. Now, towards the end of this project, um, UNHCR started being involved into something else, which is the work of the Interagency um, um, Standing Committee, working uh, specifically on Task Force 2 on accountability to affected people. Under that um, Interagency Standing Committee effort, Objective 2 is about fostering a more inclusive humanitarian system and architecture. And within that, there is a specific work stream that work on CFMs. That work stream is, you know, and this work, I want to make very sure um, that I clarify 
this work is being done by different agencies, not just by uh, UNHCR. It involves WFP, UNICEF, IFRC, and UN OCHA as part of the of the specific work stream. But of course, it is a work that it's done under the Interagency Standing Committee. So it is it is about really working together with all of the different agencies in order to come up with something that can support um, CFMs. Now, what is the goal of the work stream? Is the production of a package of principles and data standards that can help organizations to be more systematic in the use of community feedback and, and insights when they actually extract insights from community feedback to use it to adapt their programming. And the way in which the work stream is looking at this is, you know, looking at the common uh, um, the common response, looking at how we collectively respond as a system, a humanitarian system made of different organizations. So how can we make sure that regardless of how many agencies we have in a different context, regardless of how many different CFMs we set up, we have an architecture and we have a set of standards that allows all of the system to be, first of all, eventually interoperable, but also to respond to the same kind of um, um, data architecture and standards that we consider to be, let's say, the minimum or at least the basis for complaint and feedback mechanisms. So within this interagency effort, really the idea is that we want to um, kind of like make sure that we are learning from CFMs, that we are actually going through all of this work and spending this money and asking so much from communities in a way that actually does affect the way in which we work. And really the data, um, the, the community feedback data operational guiding principle and standards are, are there to really help to address these gaps. And the idea is that if you are a small organization or if you are a larger UN agency, you are responding to the same standards. Your systems can be can talk to each other because you're using and understanding the way in which you need to build the systems in the same way. So this has been a, a long uh, work. We are in the third year of, of working on these standards and on this uh, specific package. It's still going on and it's still changing. And um, we are now at the stage where, um, you know, all of the different agencies are working together to actually test these, um, these standards and the tools that we produced um, actually in real time situations and in operations on the ground. What it's coming up from it and what you see now, it's probably going to change because we we are now just in the process of receiving feedback about the standards. But the idea is that the standards are designed around the feedback uh, data cycle, right? So how do we document community feedback? How do we triage and respond to community feedback? How do we compile and share them together? And how do we present and use that information or those insights to actually uh, look at the way in which we are implementing programs? Based on the standards, there are three specific tools that have been developed so far, and those are really, this is where you can see very much the um, kind of like similar process to the one that UNHCR did individually as an organization a couple of years prior to this, and that's how we brought what we have learned into this um, interagency um, work. The first tool that was developed is a logbook, which as you see, similar to what we developed at the beginning, which was our uh, standard intake form. Now, a logbook is very similar to what you've probably seen in every single CFM. You have your data of receipt of the feedback. You have the country of uh, where the person is from. You have age, gender, and all of the demographics. And then you have the different fields um, that where you can put the message or the feedback received. And then there is a um, various system to various uh, fields to collect the information that it's needed to make sure that we can respond to that um, to that feedback. Um, personally, what I found um, quite interesting about, for example, the, the um, site management presentation is the fact that this seems to be highly customizable um, in terms of the way in which this is being presented within um, uh, the work of the task force, basically to say this is all of the fields that we think are necessary for you to collect, no matter what is the uh, type of feedback that you are collecting. And then there's a number of other fields that are suggested. And then the idea is that if you are collecting feedback, for example, related to specific sector, you can add specific fields related to that sector. 
So the idea again is to make it highly customizable. And also it is presented, as you see here, as an Excel spreadsheet, but it can be used um, you know, regardless of the system that you're using. You can take it and, and use it as a, as a paper form, or you can eventually use it as a, as a Kobo or online, or online form. Now, um, a second um, part of this of, of the form, which I think for me is very important, and it's something that we've worked a lot with UNHCR before um, joining the work of the Interagency Standing Committee, is the categorization or the taxonomy. And one of the objectives here was within the work that, that UNHCR has done before, we've really realized how many categories people tend to build in CFMs. There is almost a push for getting such broad, such um, nuanced categories that you end up with systems that have 300 or 400 different categories within the same system. What we figured um, out was that that was very counterproductive when we were going the analysis, because um, you would have a lot of categories that were 0% or 1%, and it wasn't really helpful for people working on those topics to really understand the magnitude of the changes over time. So one of the things that also was, um, you know, has been kept in mind within the Interagency Standing Committee is to really think about the minimum categories that we need, the broader buckets where we want people to put those uh, feedback when they collect them, and then a set of recommended specific content categories. And then if people want, they can even add a third set of categories if they for example, specifically want to go into details, for example, about wash or about shelter or about food distribution and so on. So the idea is, again, building something that is a larger bucket of broader categories inside which then every organization or every system can build their uh, way of categorizing and uh, packaging the data as long as the broader category remain, uh, remain the same. And then, of course, there is the sector taxonomy, which is kind of like we all know, it's all of the different sectors. And what this helps with is, again, no matter what system you use, by using a categorization based on sector, you know more or less where that information needs to go uh, and which working group or cluster will need to make sure that receives that information or is able to see that information or the analysis of the information that fall under that, under that sector. And then the second tool is an analytical framework. Now, again, here we go back to the larger kind of way in which we process and we use CFMs. Are we able to take all of the data that we collect in these systems and insert it into a framework that allow us to actually gather insights and intelligence from the data that we've collected? So this is an example analytical framework, a template that has been uh, put together by, uh, by the task force. And the idea is to help people take in the data that they have and place it into um, a system that allows us to them, you know, make specific and informed decisions. Now, every organization and every unit, uh, if they want to, can create different analytical frameworks. Every framework have different uh, focuses. The idea here is to present the general one so that then organization can be able to create their own um, way to look at the information that they are um, looking at. Again, what we're doing here is that we're moving a little bit away from are you able to respond? You know, are you know like going for example for the examples done before by site management, you know, is you know, is Rosa being able to get her issue solved, yes or no? Here also what we're looking at is how many Rosas are out there. You know, how many people have not been able to do that? And is it an issue with our distribution uh, kit not being distributed in the right way? Is it about people not knowing when the distribution is? Is it about something else? Is it about information and communication? So this is really about looking at kind of like the broader picture of what, how are we taking all of this information and actually looking at the kind of like systematic problems that we may have in the way in which we are uh, delivering those services. And then the third tool is an action tracker that is um, kind of like a very simple, if you want, kind of tool is if we you have collect your feedback and complain, you've been managed to put all of them together, you have analyzed them and you've looked at them within your analytical framework. Now you know what needs to happen. So now you can write down what needs to happen and you can track it over time. And again, this is not necessarily about, oh, Rosa needs to receive 
a new uh, a new kit. This is about oh, we need to look at we need to change our procurement or we need to change the way in which we do communication about the distribution of the kit. We need to get a better communication campaign that lets people know where do they need to go. So really about how do we track the different actions that come up from the analysis of the information that we have um, collected. And to wrap it up, we are now in the phase of field testing. So um, all of the different agencies, WFP, UNICEF and, and, and UNHCR, we are all looking at um, how can we, um, you know, where can we test these tools in CFMs that we have um, working, uh, you know, in, in different countries. Um, this is a fantastic slide put together by um, the person helping us with um, with the uh, uh, with the task force, and um, this is about the different countries and places where um, we are looking at possible either testing or where we are collecting specific feedbacks on uh, specific feedback on the different tools. And here, I think that the challenge is the usual challenge that you would have in uh, both interagency mechanism, but in general working on large CFMs, which is the staff on the ground is busy. Not everybody is is um, willing to um, dedicate extra time to test something new, changing from what you have, even if it doesn't work to something new, still does require a lot of effort and a lot of energy and resources. It's not always easy because agencies have different requirements and think in different ways and process their data differently. Um, and an extra layer of issues is, you know, different um, collective uh, complaint and feedback mechanisms may also have very different structure, very different workflows. And so there is a lot of different layers that I think are emerging from <clears throat> from the testing phase. We're still really in the middle of it, um, so hopefully there'll be um, there'll be more um, more learning coming uh, coming through, and um, you know just to um, wrap it up, um, you know the the timeline is that we are now in this phase where um, uh, the different agencies are testing and looking at what we have, what can we learn from it, trying to incorporate all of the feedback into um, the tools that have been developed, and then hopefully by January and February refine the entire package to uh, make sure that we can present it to the principals in the interagency standing committee and then look at what this package would look like and um, how can then, you know, everybody, um, you know, different agencies and different organizations actually benefit from having, um, you know, these tools available out there. And uh, I think I'm gonna stop here. I don't know if Katie wants to add anything, you are absolutely welcome to. No, no, thanks, and I hear, I just, um, I'll leave it open in terms of the, there's some questions, I'm, I'm sure, so thanks. Thanks for the presentation and also thanks to IOM, IOM colleagues for theirs as well. Very interesting. Thanks so much, Anahi. Um, um, I'm going to um, to go back to my list of uh, people with questions. So, uh, uh, Pedro, do you want to, um, to ask the questions that you've been waiting so patiently for? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Pedro. I'm the Information and Knowledge Management Advisor to the Task Force 2 on Accountability to Affected People uh, of the Interagency Standing Committee. So I work with uh, Anahi and Katie as well um, on the task force and on that specific work stream. And I would like to start by congratulating everyone for the great presentations and it shows the, the great work that has been doing um, both at, uh, in IOM and in UNHCR and it's super, super nice to see. Um, I love the points on uh, data minimization and common taxonomies from Doyle uh, and Anahi, thank you so much for the great presentation on the work we are doing at the task force. Um, so I just wanted to share as well that your feedback and contributions are highly welcome. Uh, so anyone that is interested, um, please let us know. And I will also drop on the chat uh, the link to our uh, IASC Accountability and Inclusion Help Desk that anyone, anywhere can use to ask questions about uh, AAP, community engagement, CFMs, whatever you need. Um, so please feel free to use it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro. 
Um, so going back to to my list, um, uh, Donald, you had a question um, after IOM's uh, presentation. And uh, uh, hi, Kristen. Yes. Um, yeah. My question was, uh, I think uh, most people have answered my question. It was a question that was uh, asked by, uh, what's her name? I have forgotten, but it has been answered. So I just wanted to outline, uh, uh, just to uh, let her know how the system works here in Nigeria from NRC working with the CCCM uh, colleagues. So NRC Nigeria has CFM, uh, a centralized CFM, and then uh, we have the CCCM who are at the forefront of our work in NRC Nigeria. So uh, we had a coordination and collaborated to uh, harmonize the system in the sense that what they collect at the field uh, is a replica of what happens on the CFM database and what CFM does. So the categories of feedback are there. It's uh, collected on a COBO form and all the categories are there. So not just collecting feedback and then categorizing it manually, but uh, automatically when uh, we collect, the CCCM uh, colleagues have been trained on how to ca classify these feedbacks into different grades. So that is how uh, the approach works for us in Nigeria. Thank you and over. Thanks very much, Donald, for sharing your example. Um, um, while I hand over to Deng for his question, for their question, um, um, to um, uh, Anahi, there's a couple of questions there in, in the chat. You might want to um, and see if you can answer them there or if you want to address them later. So Deng, are you there and would you like to ask your question still? Ben, can you hear me? Um, I was also wondering, Francesco, if you if your questions were answered before I um, um, invited you next year to speak. Uh, sure, if I may. Yeah, only partially, to be honest. Uh, uh, it was actually for your colleagues. Um, I just wanted to know like, what level of access other organizations in a given site or area would have because uh, from what I understand and from what uh, um, Danny mentioned, I understand that it's more of a data management system uh, internally used to facilitate the tracking. So the site manager can actually like check what complaints have been followed up, et cetera, but it doesn't seem to be automated in the sense that it automatically transfers the complaint uh, XYZ to external service providers that can automatically or like on their own, let's say autonomously access it and then like follow up. So it seems to me that it solves the, or like it, let's say, it simplifies uh, the tracking internally, but then as a site manager, I will still have to go to a coordination meeting and uh, mention the issue to the different service providers, or I will have to download the issues on a spreadsheet that I will send by email, I will get the feedback from service providers by email, et cetera, et cetera. So um, unless uh, these other service providers have the possibility to access the system and then like operate within it, and I assume that would make also external referral possible and easy to, to track and follow up and uh, feedback on. So I just wanted to know, like, uh, I mean, what, yeah, again, what level of access others have uh, or would have in case uh, the system was rolled out in the area where they operate over? Uh, hi, Francesco. Great question. And unfortunately, there's, uh, I mean, there's a few answers here. One is that um, at wherever we work, uh, all of our feedback is made transparently available on this, like a public dashboard. So this is Somalia's. We have uh, endorsement from the CCCM cluster, and we work with all the CCCM partners there. I think it's around nine, ten organizations. Um, you know, any organization has access to this. They don't. They don't need to wait for the coordination meeting. They, you know, can search their cluster, FSL. They can, you know, go further by site or district and see this sort of feedback. This is not uh, necessarily a full record of that feedback, though. So maybe there's more information, right? So there's no personal information to understand which food ration issues these are. You would need that level of information. 
we we have always said, right, if you have a mandate, like if, if you're receiving this referral, we can provide you a greater level of access. So for WFP colleagues, for UNHCR colleagues in some countries, uh, we have provided them direct uh, API linkage. So if they open a, a file or use the API, they actually get a daily update from us on the status and the details that we've agreed should be shared. Um, we can also give people in-platform access. Um, so this is actually within our system. This is just test data. You know, we can give people access to actually interact and see the data themselves. That that would be ideal for us. And in initially, uh, when I said about commissioning this work, the objective was actually that hey, we're going to give you access, and you can you can put your response right in this comment box, and you can say, okay, you know, I've responded to this. Uh, we have yet to find a context where that level of partnership or commitment uh, exists. Um, so the, the biggest, and this is why we keep coming back to how much of these challenges are technical and how much of these challenges are, let's say, political or programmatic, because we we can interact many different ways with a referral partner. We can give them, you know, automated APIs. We can send them emails if you really want. We don't think that's a good idea because of the volume, but... Um, yeah, we can do emails. We can give you access within our system. You can access it through our website. So, you know, we, we know that no one agency is going to really agree to do things one way, um, especially when we kind of look at how many agencies there are and how many responses. But even with all these different ways, we find really low engagement. So in some ways, I would say, yes, we have automated the sharing of this information, at least to a gen generic level, like uh, on our website. In, in terms of more specific details about like who exactly it is, we can automate that further. But you know, we find that agencies don't even want to kind of work with us to achieve that often, which is quite disappointing. I mean, I, I would say to some extent this work is new, uh, and I think it's an adjustment. As Nahi uh, was saying, that you know there is a, a let's say a, a challenge of data literacy. There is a challenge of people being wary of how much additional commitments this constitutes. But, you know, I think this comes back to accountability is an existing commitment. You have an existing commitment to do this. This is an additional work. We have streamlined the referral process as much as possible. We can continue to adapt and make changes to make your life easy. It, none of this uh, absolves or removes your responsibility from giving a response. Um, but yet that's kind of, I would say, our largest political challenge around the world in every context where we work. Uh, hopefully that answers your questions. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, uh, Raymond has a question. I think it's for Anahi. Um, yeah, I I reply actually to Raymond directly and saying that yeah, um, absolutely. Um, we're happy to share and to get any feedback uh, on it. You can write to me and I'll send it to you, or you can also write to Pedro. Uh, but definitely the more, the better. And then there was another question um, from Hadia, I think, about the level of disaggregation of data. So in terms of data, uh, disaggregation of data, the demographic, it's uh, the very kind of like simple one. It is vulnerability. Um, it is uh, age, gender. And uh, and then there is, um, and, but but what we have left is that different organization may want to collect different um, kind of information. So, for example, UNHCR always adds either nationality or ethnicity, because that's in in some context that's very very relevant. So uh, the idea is that the basic is what everybody you know normally collects, and then you will add um, you know the different variables that you as an organization think that it's necessary for you to collect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, um, uh, Tom, I have the exact same question as you, um, um, but uh, not just for that in Candice, also for our UNHCR colleagues. So please go ahead and ask. Um, yeah, maybe we can just say, uh, I think I think we should be careful not, uh, like any one piece of feedback doesn't imply too much, I would say, like, right, like there's going to be general problems with programming. I think we should just expect that as a part of large scale humanitarian operations. And I think we shouldn't make people feel anxious that there is a complaint about a distribution. I think that that's normal. You know, people miss distributions for all sorts of reasons, et cetera, et cetera. I think, though, where we're failing to see is at what point do we agree that this is a larger issue? You know, if if thousands of people are missing your distributions, it, it probably implies that you're not communicating your distribution schedule or you're not sharing that information with the community and we don't 
we haven't really been able to politically establish when issues are disproportionately represented, like when it when it's no longer probably just like a normal grievance that that we can expect to happen. Um, we've definitely identified these trends, but you're right, we don't see a uh, clear means of escalation. We've been working more with uh, clusters directly to try and have a greater role at cluster level in not only analyzing these trends, but then really finding advocates within the cluster system to take these up. But obviously you can imagine like, you know, some of this uh, ties into funding constraints, some of it ties into, you know, people being a bit defensive. So this is, these are difficult to address issues, but I think the point is to look at trends and not individual cases. Um, Cause I don't think like, right. If someone says they missed a distribution, I wouldn't say that it necessarily implies anything about the program that needs to change. I would need more information. You know, we, we would really need to have a more in-depth investigation on what happened there. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, Tom, do you, do you want to, um, um, to um, ask your question in public here? Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, it's a question really for Danny and Candice on the topics of CFMs being louder so that the challenges that are communicated widely within the mission and the other actors or units within the organization take their responsibilities to provide feedback a bit more seriously. Um, and it has always seemed to me that one of the biggest potential bottlenecks is um, is managerial buy-in within the mission. Um, and I was wondering, like, there are the dashboards and there are other forms of um, there are other ways that we can communicate the data that we're receiving, but um, what are your thoughts about logging the specific actions taken in response to community feedback, changes made to program activities or adjustments to service delivery, etc., um, and any modifications to projects that come out of it? Um, and my thought here is that um, how can we prove the value of an effective CFM, really? Um, by showing the the changes that come out of it in very specific examples that are well packaged and easy to understand rather than um, uh, dashboards that look complicated and maybe difficult for senior management to understand if they're in a hurry. Over. I can um, feel this one. So yeah, we do log um, for the CFM, we do log all the responses that are provided by the service providers. And the teams do talk about a lot from lots and lots of countries. And I was on a call with Ethiopia and, and um, Congo and Mozambique this week, and they all are talking about the biggest challenge they have is now that we can see all the feedback and what stages they're at, it's very difficult to get service providers to respond to those. What do they do if they don't? If they're escalating that to the sector coordinator, um levels what happens next that is very difficult and it is i mean i don't know if there is uh one particular answer to that you know there is many different communications and things we can create the dashboards on the website are mainly designed for the site managers and staff um and teams actually operating operationalizing the feedback and um, we do also produce analytical reports and we do try and show what's happening and do more broader advocacy um, on this. But I think this is something that we also touched on in our presentation that this is the challenge that we haven't really, we haven't solved. And I think this is something that different missions all struggle with is how do we make sure we are accountable, who is responsible, what happens when there isn't um, a response to feedback. Um, and if it, when the missions ask me when I'm talking to the teams that are working on the CFM, um, you know, we, we talk about obviously going to the sector coordinators meeting, talking about and getting the program managers are aware of the program, supporting them to engage with the program, working with how they receive their referrals. Do they need to change the way they're receiving their referrals? But also looking at, um, yeah, working one on one with providers as well as the sectors, but I don't think there is one solution to that. And I, I do think that there is obviously lots of different levels we can attack that at, um, but it is something we are still struggling with all. That is the major problem we have over all the countries that are working in the CFM 
is engagement with service providers. If that answers your question, sorry. It's more just to agree with you, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, thanks for answering that, Candice. Um, and uh, um, oh, I wanted to ask um, our unit our colleagues, but they have to actually leave. Um, uh, um, uh, maybe I'll direct this to uh, our IOM colleagues then and see um, um, if this, if uh, your system can be used for uh, actively collecting feedback from the displaced population. So. Um, it was good to see this um, breakdown of categories uh, by um, UNHCR, where um, uh, you know, there's one category under observations and suggestions, I suppose. The, you can um, collect something that isn't the complaints. It's not necessarily a query, um, but a service. But mm -hmm. uh, can these systems also be used as an actual um, system to for the um, displaced population to participate in decision making, I suppose, and uh, um, make changes to to the services, a little bit like what Tom was asking. Uh, yeah, I would say they can. I, I mean, I think we need to keep in mind, like, what is the objective of the system that we've designed and whether that that like that expansion fits within that objective? Be, and I, I don't say this to say that proposal isn't a bad idea. It's more to, uh, for us to think about whether we put that as part of a CFM or whether we put that as part of a different system that we might also host in Site Manager. Um, so for example, I can say we've included the way so that if a field staff is like walking around a camp and they see a, a damaged staircase, they can actually initiate a referral themselves. They don't need, we don't need to wait for the community to report this, right? So this is like one way in which we kind of expanded. We also do active collection within community engagement meetings. So we say like, hey, does anyone have feedback that they would like to share with us? And then in that meeting, that feedback's directly entered within the CFM. So CFM isn't always passive. Um, how active or passive it is, is really up to the individual program teams. We really emphasize mobile responses, mobile CFM, uh, really giving people a way to know that, hey, Danny is going to be coming through my community every week uh, when he does his rounds, and I can interface with him then. Um, we found that actually to be incredibly effective um, and, and actually incredibly effective in improving inclusion of vulnerable and marginalized groups. So yeah, I, I do believe in active collection. I mean, how active it is, like whether we're going door to door, I don't think that's necessarily necessary. Um, but yeah, some level of, of proactiveness is, is very important. OK, thanks. Thanks for answering the question. Um, Pedro, you raised your hand, but um, did it lower itself or did you change your mind? Oh, no, just being mindful of the time. I see we are over time, so I will leave it. Um, no, please go ahead. This can be our last question. Well, thank you so much. It wasn't really a question. It was to go back to Tom's intervention. Um, just to say that in terms of bringing feedback to the higher levels of the decision making in terms of humanitarian leadership, it's something that we are very mindful of and it's something that we are trying to work at the interagency level as well. So within the task force, there's also a work stream working on um, training for leadership for HCP members about AAP in general, but also about bringing feedback to the decision fora so that decisions are made based on people's voices and that programs are corrected and responses are adjusted. Um, so I, I just wanted to to let you know. Um, yeah, and I, I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you. Um, does anyone want to um, add to our address? Um, um, uh, to address that, what he was saying, or um, if not, um, Lana is asking in the chat if it's possible that both tools um, can be used in the same site or in the same country. Uh, that is what I you mean, were asking, Lana, right? From our side, I can say we work with uh, different CFMs. So I, I say I think the most uh, famous one that I'm familiar with is uh, WFP Sugar CRM, which is really large. It's used by WFP exclusively, as far as I understand. 
Um, yeah, so we understood, you know, WFP has their own system. It's it's set up. They, they made a huge investment in it. For us, it's not important to replace their solution. It's about how do we make sure we are interfacing with that solution in a good way. So we have a dedicated referral pathway set up in Bangladesh, for example, where we refer thousands of pieces of information both to the UNHCR smart registration team and both to the WFP scope program through their through their internal mechanisms. So what those mechanisms look like, you know, it's, it's slightly different in different contexts, but yeah, interoperability for us is, is a really big thing. Okay. Um, thanks for um, answering that. Um, Hadia has a question as well. Um, and then I think we should um, um, let our, um, uh, our presenters and participants uh, go back to their workday. Hadia, please. Yes, hi, thank you. So I'm just wondering um, that uh, did any of you at any time uh, while reviewing your the uh, tools and then establishing the various platforms and the interoperability um, um, ever get advice from a gen cap or a gender expert. I'm a gen cap, so I'm constantly looking for the evidence. And I really liked what was just said a while ago about making sure that decisions are taken by leadership and therefore leadership also has to be oriented, that this is a stream of information of information that can help you tailor your decisions about uh, funding uh, allocations and prioritization. So I'm just wondering if at any point in time you've had the support of a gen cap or not. Thank you. Um, I can say uh, we have consulted colleagues, like gender mainstreaming colleagues, also PSEA, also protection colleagues throughout various stages of development. And we, we're kind of in ongoing uh, discussion around how we can improve that. Uh, I don't I think we've we've definitely done analysis with uh, gender particularly in mind to identify especially disparities in the collection of feedback between men and women to really make sure that there is kind of inclusive collection uh, in terms of how that information is presented to senior management. Uh, that's kind of always an ongoing question for us. That's yeah, I mean, I think I also have to to maybe challenge you and say, well, I think the assumption is that leadership wants access to this information, um, which I, I haven't actually necessarily seen in every case, because uh, we make the information publicly accessible. Some of it is orientation, but e even post orientation, it doesn't mean the information will be uh, absorbed and actioned upon. Thanks, Danny. And um, um, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. Thank you, um, Danny and Candice, uh, as well as Anahi and uh, Katie, who are not here right now uh, from UNHCR, for your excellent presentations and for taking all of our um, um, uh, many and difficult questions. Um, it's been brilliant. Um, I just posted the link to the community engagement forum. So if very easily sign up to the to the forum and um, we'll post um, the recording from this um, webinar as well as um, all the relevant resources on the community engagement forum. So if you're part of it, you'll automatically be um, receiving that information and we can also continue this discussion there. Um, we have a, a, a chat world where we can share resources and, and uh, questions and everything. And I also just wanted to um, alert you to a webinar that ALNAP is hosting later this month. Um, it's on the 28th of November. Um, and it's it's called Going Further Than Feedback, Changing the Humanitarian System to Support Accountability. Um, at, um, so Tuesday, 28th of November at 12 o'clock. So I'll share that as well on the Community Engagement Forum. So you might be interested in continuing the discussion there. Um, and um, yes, thank you to everyone. Um, if there's anyone who wants to add anything further now, please, uh, please do. If not, I'll uh, I will close this. And uh, um, like I was saying, we will meet again on the community engagement forum. Thanks, everyone. Thank you a lot. Thank Christine. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.